At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening presenting on anxiety. Her name is Jennifer Luchtefeld. She graduated from Indiana University with a master's degree in social work in 2000. Since then, she has be been working with families and children in a variety of contexts. She enjoys seeing people build strength and resilience and face life with courage, kindness, and self-love. Jennifer, I'll pass it off to you. Thanks. Thank you uh, for being here. Welcome to above it. <laughs> and welcome to the presentation on anxiety. What is healthy and what is not? Um, we're gonna start, well, a little more introduction. We're gonna start with healthy anxiety and what what is healthy anxiety? Anxiety kind of gets a bad rap these days, um, but really it's a normal part of life. Um, healthy anxiety usually feels like worry or unease or some discomfort, but it pops up in a lot of situations. If you think about from a kid's perspective, things like starting school, meeting new friends, tests, um, you know, trying new things. Um, those are the ones I hear about the most, I think. And then as far as adults, a lot of that's similar, you know, big challenges at work, um, challenges within the family, um, struggles with health, all of those things can create some worry and some unease and discomfort. And that's kind of a normal part of life. You know, not, not everything is happy and joyful. Um, there are some things that create anxiety. And one of the positive aspects of anxiety is that it can increase your focus and energy for short periods of time. So anxiety is not always unhealthy. There are times when it can be a benefit to be a little anxious so that you can meet the demands of whatever challenges in front of you. Um, the, the catch there is though, we don't want those to be ongoing, right? We don't want long periods of you know, extreme anxiety where the body and the, and the brain is trying to keep up with that level of focus and energy. Um, and so when we look at it, the other side of it, when we look at anxiety disorder, and we call it a disorder because it means the, you know, it's not working correctly. It's not working to help you function and to make life um, be the way that you're trying to make it. Um, and this level or frequency of anxiety that prevents you from doing what you want or what you need to do. And obviously there's room for some subjective pieces here. You know, need, wants aren't always necessary, but certainly needs are. Um, and so we talk about anxiety that, you know, interferes with some of the life sustaining activities, eat, sleep, drink, defecate, urinate. Those are serious issues that need treatment very quickly. Um, we don't you know, when anxiety starts to interfere with those kinds of things, things can, you know, health can deteriorate rapidly. And we don't, you know, most of us don't want to see that. So um, it, other levels of anxiety disorder might in, impair your ability to do work or school stuff. There's some people, you know, I think it's pretty well known that some people get so anxious about a test that they have difficulty thinking and they tend to perform poorly, even though they know the material. Um, so, and, you know, work can be the same. Maybe it's not called a test anymore, but maybe it's a big challenge and, the, you know, the anxiety gets too big and prevents you from doing those things that you know that you're capable of and would really like to do. Um, anxiety can interfere with relationships for sure. You know, when someone is anxious and anxious frequently, anxious at high intensity levels, um, the high intensity can cause a lot of irritability and anger and frustration and the high frequency can just wear people out and leave them with little energy to put into relationships, um, including relationships with themselves, which is why self-care is on here as well. Some people are, you know, the anxiety interferes with their ability to shower um, or get out of bed in the morning or take care of, you know, other duties that are necessary for keeping their life in order. And that's when you're talking about a disorder level of anxiety is when it starts to impair functioning. Um, you, know, you see it getting in the way of the things that you want or need to do about life. So we're going to give us a little framework for thinking about anxiety and how we experience anxiety in the world. And this will help us be able to talk about it, um, understand where we are and understand where other people that we care about are. And later we'll talk through this same um, framework in a way that helps us figure out ways of supporting ourselves and others. But for now, we want to look at this and talk about um, each one of these zones. Um, and so the first zone, the outside, is this panic. And that's that unhealthy level of anxiety, especially if it's sustained for long periods of time. 
You can have decreased cognitive function. This is a real effect of anxiety. It really pulls the blood out of the thinking part of your brain and puts it in your body to make your body ready for whatever danger is ahead, which is very effective in a situation where there is a physical danger, but most of the time, uh, this anxiety in present day is coming more from irritations and annoyances and frustrations. Um, and if we have our cognitive functioning working, we can generally work those things out. But when our anxiety gets really high and the cognitive function decreases, it makes it hard to problem solve and get through some of those difficulties. If, you know, some of the other cues to that the decreased cognitive function might be happening are things like increased heart rate and increased breathing rate. One of the first things the body does is speed up the heart and speed up the breathing. You might notice sweaty palms, nausea, wobbly or shaky muscles. You might get a headache, muscle tension or vomiting. And a person who's in a real severe level of panic might show some behaviors that don't necessarily make logical sense. And those behaviors tend to be categorized in four groups. Um, panic often leads to people running, fighting, hiding, or freezing. Um, and you'll hear people say, well, she got really upset and she shut down. That's sometimes the way we describe a freeze. Um, one of the other more common ones that I hear are in younger kids, kindergartners and first graders, they um, hid underneath the desk. Well, that's, yeah, hiding. That happens when people get really anxious. Um, you'll also hear people running from, you know, whatever the scene, the school, the work, um, or the relationship. A, a run is also a panic. Um, induced move lots of times. And then the last one, fighting. Um, you know, when we're really scared, lots of times we think that violence is going to get us safe again. Um, so that's what the brain does. Um, and then if we talk about this next level of disequilibrium, this is where you feel off balance. And a lot of people say that this is where growth happens and that you cannot have growth without having some disequilibrium in your life. Um, I like to think about this as if you're standing on one foot. You know, most of us can do that. We're a little wobbly. It's easier to knock us off our balance, um, but we're capable of holding that to some degree. Um, and this is just, it kind of correlates with a mild to moderate feeling of unease. You might still notice an increased heart rate and increased breathing. You might notice that your skin is hot. I usually notice that my face is hot. Um, you're, you're, but this is where you're going to get that increased focus for short periods and increased energy for short periods you're probably also going to have a kind of a jumble of feelings, you know, an awareness of potential embarrassment, also some excitement, some fear, some curiosity, all kind of mixed together. And that's kind of a good kind of anxiety, the kind that goes, oh, what's next? And how do I, you know, meet this challenge? And what am I going to learn about myself? And how do I move forward? And, you know, a lot of times people get really fired up about that and really enjoy that part of life. Um, for other people, you know, it can quickly move into panic. And so one of the goals when we talk about treatment is, is expanding this disequilibrium zone um, and helping people be tolerant of it and knowing how to do self-care when they've been in it too long or when they've, you know, gone through the edge and ended up in panic. So when we talk about comfort zone, this is where we feel safe, cared for, loved, um, everybody experiences comfort differently. And that has a lot to do with their sensory setup. Everybody's sensory setup is a little different. Um, so the first one I like to talk about is soothing the senses. Uh, I, you know, I think it's interesting that we support so many bed, um, bath and body work stores because they address a lot of our sensory stuff, um, you know, smell and uh, even visual stuff, their packaging and stuff is geared towards soothing the senses. Um, but there's a lot of different ways we can do that. A lot of people are tactile and enjoy touch. Um, a lot of people, it's a sound thing. They love music or white noise or um, I would think of Tibetan bells. Um, some people, you know, it's more about taste. That's why comfort food sometimes works. Um, and for, you know, can be sense of smell. Sense of smell can kind of activate those other soothing things. And then other things that, you know, enhance that soothing is just a feeling of belonging and knowing that you can be where you are and be safe and comfortable or a sense of acceptance. Um, when things are kind of known and predictable, it helps. Um, oddly, it helps even if those known and predictable things are not great things. If they're known and predictable, it's better than when things are chaotic. We tend to feel more comforted by that. 
Um, and this is where you're going to have your lowest heart rate, your lowest breathing rate, your muscles feel soft and relaxed, and sleep is usually possible in this situation. Um, but those are kind of the three rings or three levels of comfort zone, disequilibrium, and panic. Um, that just kind of a ref refresh. And we want so that when you're talking about disorder, it's when your normal activities that you need to do push you into panic zone. Um, that's disordered anxiety. I've talked to a number of people who will say, I was panicking, you know, I don't know what happened. And then in talking through it, we find out they were in an incredibly stressful, sometimes even dangerous situation. And in those situations, panic is normal. It's part of the way our body's set up to protect ourselves. Um, so it's really when we're talking about disorder, we're looking at those daily normal activity things that are made impossible because panic is too strong in those situations. That's when it's disorder level. Um, so just a little bit um, about the prevalence of anxiety disorders. It's actually, they, you know, the statistics come from kind of a blend of the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Health and Mayo Clinic, but about 30% of adults will have an anxiety disorder at some point in their lives, which is really a pretty high number. Um, and about 20% of the population has an anxiety disorder at any one time. The rates are one and a half to two times higher among women and people of the LGBTQIA community. And minority community members are more likely to qualify for a PTSD diagnosis which is a specific kind of anxiety disorder that's a result of trauma sometimes. So anxiety disorders in general, there's a group of them, and I'm not gonna go into detail about all of them today, just you know, know the general ideas about them. Anxiety left untreated. So it often gets worse over time because the brain has this thing about pathways. It loves to build pathways, and if you think about the brain building a pathway the same way you would in like a meadow or a field. And the first time you walk through that meadow, you could come back the next day and probably not be able to find much of the path that you left behind. But when you follow that path every day or multiple times a day, that path gets wider and wider and wider. And pretty soon there's no grass there. It's just dirt and it starts to expand. And the brain does the same thing. If it runs the same loop, if it runs the same pathway repeatedly, it makes that pathway stronger and wider and more apt to take in things that don't really need to be there and don't need to be headed through that pathway. So anxiety can kind of um, magnify itself if you're not careful and if you don't do some treatment of it. It can also, anxiety left untreated can cause physical health issues. The biggest one that I see is trouble sleeping. And that may sound like a small thing unless you've experienced it and then you know what I'm talking about. It can be pretty, pretty severe. Um, but when you have a lack of sleep, it can impact mood and mood management. It can impact other health systems. It's, you know, sleep is something that's required for brains to kind of reset themselves and restructure. Um, it also contributes to digestive issues, headaches. It can, you know, increase chronic pain and create a poor quality of life. And anxiety is also pretty connected to suicide. Uh, a lot of people know that depression is connected to suicide, um, but anxiety is as well. And that part of the thing with anxiety is that it gives people motivation to so-called fix the problem. And so if they're struggling and suicide looks like a solution, anxiety gives them energy and focus to act on that solution, which is why anxiety is correlated with suicide. So if you're struggling with thoughts of suicide and you're feeling very anxious, it's a good time to reach out for help and please do. Um, treatment options around anxiety, primarily are talk therapy. And within the talk therapy models, we have cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, you know, traditionally used by most therapists as a frontline treatment. Um, the second one is acceptance and commitment therapy that we use for higher levels of anxiety. And then the final one is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which um, is primarily used for trauma, but can, you know, does have some situations where it can be used with other varieties of anxiety. And between the three of those, we can, we, we 
can take a lot of the edges off anxiety and help people be more functional. And, you know, then of course, lifestyle and general health impact mental health for sure. And so if you are capable and you have the means to eat well, then that's a great way to help support mental health and also sleeping well and exercising also helps support mental health. Um, medication, you know, I don't want to say a lot about this. It's not my expertise area. There are medications that can help with anxiety. Um, and definitely, you know, the opinion of a psychiatrist is very valuable if that's something that you're interested in or are looking towards. So, so those are the main treatment options. Um, and then if we go back to this and we talk about support and we talk about how do we help, you know, the people around us, how do we help ourselves? make sure that we can tolerate a healthy disequilibrium zone, how do we know to get to our comfort zone, and you know, when we're on the edge of that panic zone and how to stay out of that. And there's some kind of simple methods that work with the science of how the brain works that um, help us do this. And so if we start with this disequilibrium idea and we talk about how do we manage this in a healthy way, how do we not let it get into panic, how do we keep it at this level that doesn't impact our health, um, and helps us stay focused and motivated. We use these things called coping skills. And there's been a lot of talk about these. Um, and I think a lot of frustration from people who find that whatever they've been told doesn't really work or doesn't work all the time. And so the three that I'll talk about are three that have a lot of research behind them and tend to work um, when you're in this disequilibrium phase for kind of maintaining that phase and keeping from getting into panic mode if they're used appropriately and correctly. And the first, so those coping skills, the general definition is something you do in a moment of disequilibrium to improve cognitive function and ease physical response. So notice these are not going to solve the problem. They're not going to fix whatever caused the anxiety, whatever is kicking up that anxiety. They're just going to keep your cognitive functioning more on board and they're going to help the physical response not get too severe. So the first one is breathing. And you'll see us here deep all the way to the belly breath. And this picture of this whale has got this nice big belly um, that shows us how this deep breathing works. And it's important to remember this all the way deep down into your belly part of things. Because um, most of us don't do that. So if you think about it, if you breathe in deeply, you want your belly to go out, you want your ribs to expand to side to side, and you want your shoulders to stay down. That gives you a good deep breath. And when you're breathing, when you're upset, your breathing tends to speed up, like we've talked about. And when you, the fast breathing will trigger the rest of your body to speed up. But if you slow your breathing, you tell your body you're safe and you help to show, to slow your body down. So this big deep breath helps slow the body down. It helps slow the heart down. It helps, you know, shut down the releases of the adrenaline and cortisol um, or not let them release if they aren't already on their way. Um, so that's one of the big coping skills. And there's a whole lot of things on the web about deep breathing. And I added this one in here. This is from YouTube, and it's just one minute of deep breathing. You breathe in when this shape gets bigger and out as it gets smaller. And I will play this, and we can try it for a minute. So that was one minute of deep breathing. If you did that with us, take a minute and feel if you feel any muscles that are a little more relaxed. Um, 
breathing will help do that. It'll help relax the muscles, help keep the brain cognitive function going. And this is the effective coping skill number two, counting. Um, doesn't have to be counting, we're just looking for something that's kind of concrete, something that has an answer. Um, and we want it to be something that's a little bit difficult for you. Thinking about numbers or this kind of concrete idea helps get blood back up into thinking brain and again helps support the cognitive function when you're in that disequilibrium zone. Um, some people, I've had people tell me they count backwards from a thousand by seven. Um, someone who picks a scene of a, a visual media thing, movie or cartoon, and identifies as many of the details in that scene as they can. Um, someone else who loves music, who keeps track of the top song in the top 40 and sings the lyrics to that song, and so it changes as the top 40 changes. Um, I tend to do multiples of three. I'm not great at math, and multiples of three get me, um, especially three times six, because I don't understand how 18 goes with all that. But anyway, it kicks my brain back into gear. So if you can find something that works for you and just a short little kind of distraction to keep the brain um, functioning and then go back to whatever that was that caused the problem to begin with and see if you can kind of start sorting through it. And these are things you can support other people doing, right? If you're doing deep breathing, they're more likely to do deep breathing. If you know how to do it, know how to explain it, then they're more likely to do it effectively if you help them understand that. And as far as this counting stuff, you can oftentimes do this for a person by asking them, what's your birthday? What's your phone number? Um, can you tell me your address? Co you know, concrete things that kind of trick their brain into, you know, getting that cognitive function back on board um, and help them you know, balance the emotion and the cognitive function. And the final coping skill is just asking questions about the current situation. So we have this list, who, what, when, where, how, and if you notice there is no why in here for some reason when people are really distressed, why tends to trigger people. Um, I read it somewhere, it seems to have, it seems true in my experience, and so I've stopped using why with people, especially when they're upset. Um, the other part of this, the questions about the current situation, they help you focus on right now. Our brain tends to connect things that have similar feelings. And so if something scares us, oftentimes our brain goes back to all the other things that have scared us. And then we're making decisions with information that isn't relevant to the current situation. Um, and so asking questions about the current situation can help you and also can help others. Um, help you understand each other's point of view about what's really happening in that moment. Um, it can help you sort through the things that are from the past and the things that are from the now uh, and help you make clear decisions about what's happening in the present um, and also keep thinking brain working. Uh, oftentimes can kind of bridge that gap of age and size and gender and even race um, because lots of times what we experience is not what the other person can predict. And so for asking those questions and answering those questions, we have a better sense of what everyone's experiencing in the situation. Um, so those three skills, breathe, count, ask questions, there it is. Um, and then if we spend some time on this comfort zone thing, especially if you're trying to support other people, if you take a minute and think about somebody that you would like to support, and do you know any of their favorite comfort zone things? Um, sometimes this is as simple as picking up, you know, their favorite scented candle somewhere, or, um, you know, making sure the fuzzy blanket is clean, or making sure the fuzzy blanket has not been cleaned, and so it smells the way they want it to smell. Um, making sure people have a temperature that they like, you know, people can be really sensitive to that, and it can be frustrating to you know, sit or stay in a space that isn't comfortable for their body. Um, we kind of think about those. We could also do, talk you through a little meditation. I'm not going to do this right now, but I want to tell you a simple one that you could try on your own. And this one is, they call it the solar meditation. And basically you start by taking a couple of those big, deep belly breaths and you close your eyes, and I'm not asking you to do that right now, I'm just asking you to understand this process. Um, but after you've closed the eyes, you start to think about the sun shining down on your head, warming up your head, 
and warming up your muscles and helping them feel soft and heavy. And those words soft and heavy are important in this. Um, and you let that warmth seep down through your face, down the back of your neck, around your shoulders and your shoulder blades where that warmth and heaviness settles into the muscles. And keep moving that warmth and heaviness down through the body. The sun kind of fills up all the parts and warms everything up and makes all the muscles warm and heavy. And when you get all the way to your toes, you can tell yourself, I can stay here as long as I'd like. And when I'm ready, I'll wiggle my fingers and toes and come back to where I started. Um, it's surprising how powerful that can be to kind of relax the system. There are a million different ways to do meditation. This one, if you're looking for other ideas, would fall under the category of visualization. Um, so if you look up visualization scripts, you probably find a lot more information and other ones to try. Um, I know some people, when they hear the word meditation, they get a little nervous about it. I would encourage you to try whatever you're comfortable with and do a little research to find the variety that suits you, because um, there are a lot of them out there. Um, and for a wrap up, I just wanted to point out some of the places where I like to go for information. Some helpful websites are the National Institute of Health and just the acronym NIH in a Google search will get you there. Um, the same with the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH in a Google search bar will get you there. And then Mayo Clinic has been one of my favorites for kind of a quick hit reference on um, you know, any of the mental health disorders and basics around what treatment looks like and even suggestions on parenting and supporting others who have those disorders. Um, NIH and NIMH are much more intensive ones. If you want a rabbit hole to go down, they will, they have those. Mayo Clinic is more of a quick hit, give you the basics and be on your way. Um, Google search terms to try, mindfulness um, has a heavy duty impact on anxiety. Deep breathing techniques, deep breathing has an incredibly powerful impact and the more you learn about it, the more powerful you can make it. Some book ideas, Rewiring the Anxious Brain by Pittman and Carl. Um, and The Tapping Solution for Teenage Girls by Christine Wheeler. I like both of those. And then some apps. Um, I've tried and I've, I've heard plenty of clients talk about both Headspace and Calm, and they are really good. And they will walk you through some of those visualization meditation stuff. Um, the final one, I Am Sober, I don't have as much experience with, but I've heard good things from people using it outside of just sobriety. Um, so if you're curious, check it out. And if you think it'll work for you, you know, give it a shot. But I've heard so many good things about it. I wanted to make sure I put it on here. Um, and then finally, we just have, you know, ending information. That's my name and my organization, a phone number there if you would want to call and get in with our services. And then um, the Healthy 365 Connection Center, Suicide Prevention Hotline, Community Health Network Crisis, and then a crisis line that you can text. Um, anyway, thank you for being here and being with us today. And I hope this was informative and helpful. And hope you've got some takeaways that will work for you. Thank you very much.